kicking this off, uh, I quick, I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Jasmine Wilson and I come from the Musqueam Nation. Uh, I would like to virtually welcome you to the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil tooth Nations. I am the Indigenous Programs and Community Engagement Coordinator here at the Museum of Vancouver. So I'd just like to welcome you once again. Uh, and I'd just like to thank you all for joining us virtually today. And I'd like to give a special thank you to the Chinese Canadian Museum for this amazing collaboration. Uh, before we begin, I just want you all to know that we have closed captioning available for anybody that needs it. And you could post your questions in the chat box and we'll be doing a QA and a afterwards. Um, and it's a great honor and privilege to welcome Elder Larry Grant and Wade Grant today as they discuss their cultural identity and reflecting on being not only Muslim, but also Chinese as well. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to pass it on over to our next panelist, Sarah Ling uh, from the CCM. So once again, thank you for joining. Good evening, everyone. And, and thank you, Jasmine. On behalf of the Chinese Canadian Museum, it's a pleasure to co-host this webinar uh, this evening. For those of you who are new to our, our organization, um, we've just turned one year old and we are working hard to establish a permanent museum with a, a hub in Vancouver, Chinatown to tell the stories and experiences of Chinese Canadians. And um, our connection to indigenous peoples in the province is certainly a fundamental part of our shared story. So we're very thrilled to be part of this initial program with uh, Larry and Wade from Musqueam and we're committed to continuing these conversations um, moving forward. And so I think now we'll invite um, Larry to provide a welcome to the territory. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, CEM, just well up a e nomin who e to e to no whale who e to e at the Tama could must grill. Look up as well across the need bombing e slow at us. The egg when it's you in it, a palano set to something need to swallow up a helix dollar. I tap ill simp as you know. I can swallow and can see. But Nala to Mukalap for E to E, E to Slim Nala, the Slim Nam, and E to Sight Disqualo and Hide the Bellisium, see your thumb. And say thank you to everyone that's logged on this evening. My name's Larry Grant. Ayatluck is my name from Musqueam. A uh, descendant of Piapalan of the warrior that greeted the first Spanish ship under Captain Narvez and the first ship under Captain George Vancouver. And as our ancestor Piapalano had done in the past, I do today and raise my hands and welcome to all of you here on the traditional ancestral unceded lands of the Hunt Caminum speaking Muscan people that we share along with our relatives from Squamish and our relatives from Slavodar. Thank you. I think to begin, we're going to share a video clip of the documentary, All Our Father's Relations. And it's a bit of a memory lane for me personally, as I got to accompany Larry and Wade during that time um, as part of the film crew. And um, for those of you who haven't heard about the film before, it, it documents Larry and his family's story uh, growing up as Musqueam and Chinese and follows them on their journey in 2013 to their father's ancestral homelands in Seimun, Guangdong, China. And Wade, uh, Larry's nephew, was there as well. And so we're going to start with an introductory scene to give you um, a sense of, of the story. And we'll be referring back to different clips um, 
during Wade's conversation uh, with Larry. Mm. Can everyone see this all right? We had many Chinese market gardeners living in their bunkhouses here at Musquim. In the winter, they would hear these drums beating every night. One day, one of our Chinese relatives approached my grandfather, Seymour Grant, and said, what is happening? And my grandfather would commence to tell them that these were our winter ceremonies. Then he asked the question, would we be allowed to come and watch and listen? My grandfather said they were more than welcome. So one evening, a few of my relatives came to the door and asked if they could enter our big house. Like good neighbors, they didn't just come and observe. They came with an offering of fruit for that house. They wanted to be part of our community. They always spoke about the arrival of the Chinese people into our community. You have to understand that the Aboriginal people, the Musqueam people have lived here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And then all of a sudden we have the arrival of a new body of people. And uh, the next thing you know, they're living on our land. But respectfully, they've asked permission to be able to come here and to farm this land. Well, my grandfather from China came to Musqueam to farm. They did that mostly on a handshake basis. There were no real leases at that time until the Department of Indian Affairs took it over. It was very, very beneficial to the farmers, but also to the Musqueam community. Under the Indian Act, the federal government of Canada decrees whether or not you're an Indian or Aboriginal person by their definition. We grew up as Muslim children. All our teachings had been passed down from our primary caregivers who were Muslim. But one day, the government decided that we would be classified as Chinese. We were registered as the bastard children of Agnes Grant. After our parents were married and before Howard was born, the Indian agent struck a line through the names of me and my sibling, no longer recognizing us as members of the Musqueam Indian Band. With three strokes, our lives changed. So every year, our cousins were taken to Indian Residential School at St. Mary's in Mission City because they were Indian. We weren't taken because we were Chinese. Why, you know, aren't we all human beings? You know, this is the land of, of my, my ancestors and yet we're being denied. Pieces of legislation that were created by a foreign element, the European that, that came to this country and tried to impose their laws, their way of life onto others became a very challenging 
exercise because it tore apart family structures. The Indian Residential School Act was an act created to basically kill the Indian in the child, to remove all vestiges of Indian culture out of that child. But what it did was break up families and children were, were kidnapped, basically kidnapped and taken forcibly to the Indian residential schools to be away from their parents, from their language, and all other community members. That in turn created trauma with the parent generation. It, 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 it all of a sudden, they had lost their children. It is as if a death had occurred. It's a completely disconnected child that comes out of that school. A disconnect of self-worth, a disconnect from community, family, culture, spirituality, and geography. Anyone that's disconnected from all of that will begin to self-medicate. And if you have no self-worth, where do you go? So that's a teaser from the film, a few clips that we wanted to share. Um, for the fuller length, you can view it online. There's also select scenes in our exhibitions at the Museum of Vancouver and at the inaugural exhibition of the Chinese Canadian Museum. Um, it's now a pleasure to bring our moderator Wade into the conversation. Um, a little bit more about Wade, other than the fact that he's one of Larry's favorite nephews. Uh, Wade Grant currently serves as the Intergovernmental Affairs Officer to the Musqueam Nation while also serving as a board member for the First Nations Health Council and the Covenant House. Prior to working for his community, Wade spent three years with the BC Provincial Government as the Special Advisor on First Nations Issues to the Premier, where he convened groups to talk with the province about unresolved issues with the BC First Nations. Previously, he's also served on the Vancouver Police Board, was an Economic Development Officer, and band council member with the Musqueam uh, Nation. So over to you, Wade. Well, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Jasmine, for the welcome. And uh, it's so good to see young Indigenous uh, people stepping forward and uh, embracing who you are as a, uh, as a Musqueam. But I also know that uh, you, your family on the Wilson side is very proud of you as well. So thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, and I just want to thank for the introduction, Sarah. Uh, but the one thing I'm uh, I'm proudest of is, of course, being a descendant of uh, of um, my grandma Agnes Grant and grandfather uh, Hung uh, Tim Hing, who were the parents of uh, of my uncle Larry Grant, who I'm so honored to once again be sitting here with. I look at this tonight as my opportunity to sort of go back to the old ways that uh, my father and my uncles have talked about talking with your elders around the kitchen table, just asking questions and making sure that uh, the lessons and the history and the teachings that they have are, are, are always uh, passed on to the next generations. And, you know, I uh, haven't been able to do that much lately. Of course, none of us have because of uh, the pandemic we're in, but I've always, always wanting, always open to having conversations with my uncle Ayathak uh, Larry Grant, because there is a wealth of knowledge that, uh, you know, I wish I, I, I could put into an encyclopedia. So tonight, I want to ask a few questions from him uh, based on, you know, his life, uh, his experiences as a, a mixed race uh, Canadian uh, that uh, grew up uh, in a time where both sides of his family were treated as third class citizens in a country that that grew up around his uh, his ancestors. So Uncle, I, I thank you for allowing me to do this tonight, and um, I look forward to, to having this conversation. 
So myself being uh, of Chinese First Nations and, and Caucasian ancestry, you know, there are a number of things that uh, I grew up with that uh, it's self-identification. Well, who am I as a, as a person? Am I Chinese? Am I, am I Musqueam? Am I Caucasian? Am I Canadian? I, I don't ever really try to pinhole myself into one space. I, I, I'm proud of everything I have. So my first question to you, Uncle Larry, is growing up, uh, in Musqueam or in da in Chinatown, as you did part of your life as well, did you have those same sort of, um, you know, reservations about self-identification of who you were in the 1940s and 50s? Uh, that's, that's quite a question. Yeah, I, uh, as a child growing up in Chinatown, I knew uh, because we had to go down there to go to school and uh, it was interesting to, because we carried our dad's name, his Chinese name, and we were considered Chinese. But in our minds, we were predominantly Musqueam. And that was always denied in school in the sense that uh, the teachers would say, no, 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 you're not, you're not an Indian child, you're, you're Chinese because you got a Chinese name. Uh, so that kind of gives you a, a mixed feeling all the time when you say, no, no, I'm, I'm Musqueam. Because uh, our primary caregiver is a Musqueam person and Musqueam family. And our Chinese uh, parent, there were no Chinese women around. There were a very, very limited number of Chinese women were allowed to enter Canada. So we couldn't uh, kind of uh, uh, identify or have a relationship with Chinese women, like mothers or aunties. So that uh, our mindset was Musqueam, but predominantly Musqueam, but it, it was always a challenge as soon as he said, no, I'm, I'm an Indian, I'm half Indian, you know, and like, oh, yeah, but you're Chinese, you're Chinese, you know, so that was always the way it was viewed uh, from, from the Caucasian point of view. However, the, from the Chinatown point of view, it was, can you speak Cantonese? No, no, I, I can't really converse. Uh, then how do you call yourself Chinese if you're not able to speak your language? So that was a, a very, very strong question that always stuck in my mind. And, and now as an elder trying to reawaken our language here at Musqueam, that always popped into my head. How can you be who you say you are if you don't have a language to identify yourself with. And that's, uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's a comment that sounds insulting, but it's, it's not insulting in the way it's being put forward. It's, it's a major, major identifier is your mother tongue. And that's uh, important to to carry with you so that, uh, and it's not denying the other parts that you carry. It, it, it's something that uh, I, uh, I would say because uh, British Columbia is monolingual and knowing different languages, which many, many people do, they're, they're multilingual and Everyone praises them. However, we grew up in an era that denied all sorts of languages other than English as a, uh, as a language of privilege. So it, it sort of, even today, it's the language of privilege. And you kind of, put aside other languages to, to be able to belong to that 
privileged group in some way that uh, would help you move through your life economically and that's, for me that's how I feel about that I, that question you asked that uh, I, well, well, thanks, Uncle. I appreciate the, the answer. And, uh, you know, I, growing up in your generation, I, I know that uh, that um, a mixed uh, mixed family like yourself was uh, was probably not as uh, as common as it, as it is today. Um, so I'm thinking even even down on the reserve uh, in Musqueam, uh, the intermarriage between the, uh, the Chinese farmers and, and Musqueam were uh, we're few and far between. I, I'm I'm wondering if you could elaborate on how our family came together. How did uh, Grandma Agnes and and your father uh, Hung Tim Hing? How did they meet? And you know how was that viewed in in the community? Uh, well, that was a that's that's an interesting one too, in the sense that how did our parents meet? <clears throat> how did your grandparents meet? Uh, there were there were actually two only two sets of family uh, children I should say that that actually came from a relationship between the Chinese farmers and the Muslim ladies and uh, that's quite interesting too because uh, there were about a hundred Chinese farmers down here that basically lived a bachelor's life. On uh, tending the farm, because as I said uh, earlier, there there was a limited number of Chinese women uh, that were allowed to enter into Canada. Well, our grand, our Chinese grandfather, and, and I, honestly, to this day, do not know his name. Uh, Uncle Edmund probably knows it. But brought a grandfather brought over his son, which who is our who became our father in probably 1920, and he would have been about 14, maybe 15 years old, and uh, he spent a few years downtown before he came out to the farm. And then uh, as he was working on the farm, would see this young woman walking by the farm, always either by herself or with old people, older people, and was intrigued. And I guess uh, she would, well, they are, they were quite good looking women here at Musqueam. So at the, uh, they still are the beautiful ladies. And uh, notice that it, she, she never had a partner. And our, our mother was the oldest of the daughter, living daughters. And they, her younger sisters had already married before she did. And I don't think she actually had intentions of marrying because she was taking care of her parents. She was uh, the one that, she was the oldest daughter and was taking care of our grandparents, our, our Muscan grandparents. So uh, I don't think she intended to marry. That our father to be <clears throat> came down exactly the way our old people do at that time. He came with someone and spoke to our grandparents and asked if he would be allowed to marry our our mother. And that custom was exactly the same that the way they do in China, that 
people that intend to marry or, or uh, arrange a marriage for you will come and ask the parents of the, the ladies to become the wives of whomever they're asking for. And our grandfather at that time was was interesting person also in the sense that one daughter was married to a Muslim person, uh, another daughter uh, was married to indigenous Muslim person, but had separated and taken on a Caucasian partner. So he, he in his mind, was, was thinking also, and this is a story that was told to me by our mother, in his mind, okay, nobody in our community has a Chinese person. Let's see how my grandchildren turn out. The one from in, indigenous Muslim, the one from the Caucasian relationship, or one from the Chinese relationship. So that's how they got together. Grandfather uh, being, having that personality thinking, I uh, have a mixed heritage grandchildren, which one is going to take the lead? So, and that's, uh, that's the story that was handed down to me from our our mother, your grand, your grandmother. So that's uh, how they got together. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, thanks. Uh, but um, how was? I mean, our family, of of course, you know, we're proud of who we are as as Hongs and as of France. But was there any was there any uh, backlash in Musqueam that there, that there was an from other families, or was it just was it accepted? Is it a something that was, because like I said before, I don't think it was uh, something that was common. So it, was there any any issues, do you think? Or do you know? Well, uh, our old folks, like when I say old folks, and that's our grandparents and great grandparents generation. Uh, I don't know how much that very first pandemic played a part of this. Uh, we're, before uh, Narvez and Vancouver arrived, uh, a pandemic had run through the indigenous communities all across North America and devastated the communities to the point where uh, there was a huge loss, maybe 90% of our people were lost to that first pandemic. And uh, I and our older brother, we didn't, from, from our old people, we didn't feel any backlash, in negative backlash. We were always considered the grandchildren of Job Coletta and Teoplano's uh, granddaughter, or our grandmother. So that's... Uh, and we belonged to Musqueam, but we also belonged to our extended family that lived on Vancouver Island and down in the state of Washington, that we were always considered the grandchildren of Copaleta of Musqueam. And there was, we were accepted wherever we went as long as we explained who our parent, what our Muslim parent was, and who our Muslim grandparents were, and they said, "Oh, you 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 belong to that family over there. Uh, go talk to them over there. Uh, you are part of us." And it's not until the group that really, really went to Indian residential school. 
the younger ones, that a racial hierarchy started to appear uh, in the form of, yeah, you're part Chinese, you're not, you, you're not as privileged as uh, the half white guys that we have in Musqueam. So we already had uh, half, half English, half Irish, half Scandinavian, and, and uh, some people were part Hawaiian and part Chilean. And that part didn't seem to play as great a role in negativity as being part Chinese. And I am, I'm assuming that it's a hierarchy they learned in Indian residential school. So that there, there was, there was a little bit of racism then. More, more, more specifically, when, <clears throat> as we know that young people are uh, uh, they get quite aggressive about things that they're not fully familiar with, that they're not educated about uh, the different racial uh, content of people it really doesn't matter. And what matters is what kind of a person are you, you know, uh, in social uh, circumstances. So um, that was how I saw it and, and experienced it. It was in times of anger or frustration, very much like what's going on right now. It's a COVID-19. There's a lot of anger, there's a lot of frustration uh, and there's a lot of people that view, there's a lot of jealousy in, in, in the perception of privilege uh, and the ability to move around. So that, uh, that brings a lot of things out that <laughs> normally wouldn't bother you. Uh, so that's uh, how, uh, because our young, uh, our community was in a reserve confined to a reserve. Uh, and when we, when we look at our dialect, our language continuum is from Point Grey across the water to Howe Sound, approximately a Harvey Creek area, then across the mountain, down into Indian Arm, down to Slavotot and the crossover to Kirkland, KC, up to Kwantlen, and then back down south to Sawatan on the south arm and back. So our people were all over the place, but they also had extended families in different communities. So that's, uh, to me, that's how, how large our community was, but now confined to less than 200 hectares, there's a lot of frustration comes out. A lot, a, a, a lot of confinement, a lot of loss of movement, language, culture, fam familial connection. Very much like we have today, our familial connections are not solid. They're there, but they're not. And the only time we see that is at funerals. We, are, we see the familial connections that we have in funerals where people will come from all over to, to support parts of their families that they have to bury. And, uh, and, and that's really something to see that people come from all over the province and the state of Washington or, or other parts of America and say, I am part of this family. I know my genealogy, we are connected and, and they come. But because of the uh, social circumstances that we lived under uh, and the privileges that were uh, uh, given to uh, the different ethnic groups within the societal structure we lived in that 
that brought forward a lot of hard feelings and, uh, and feelings of privilege that or the fragility of your feelings of privilege are, 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 are being challenged. So that a lot of those things happen. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I do know that when I was growing up, uh, I understand the, uh, you know, the change because, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, if I had disagreements with people of my age as a, as a child in Muskim, uh, it was an easy target to target my, my Chinese heritage for, for them. So the only time I ever got called the CH, C-H-I-N, K-word was from uh, my cousins or, or friends on the reserve because it was easy to target my difference rather than look at my, my similarity. So I understand, I understand how that sort of changed, but I, I do remember one thing you said in the video, and I really wanted just to elaborate a bit on this, is that you talked about, um, you know, um, you didn't want to speak, when you were a child, you didn't want to speak Hunk Minam, and you didn't want to speak Cantonese, so you said, I want to, I'm just going to speak Canadian. You know, you said that in the video. And, but what made you change your mind after that? Like, now you're a, you're a fluent speaker in Hunk Minam, you're proud to be a, a Chinese Canadian as well. From that child that said, you know what, I'm just going to be Canadian, or whatever uh, a, a Canadian should be, to now being a person that teaches our language in universities, how did that change that you, you, you said you embraced who you are as both? Because I know there was a time that you were trying to distance yourself from that as a child. Okay, I, I have that, that, that question. I have to start from childhood. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I was born premature and I know my mother took care of me 24 seven, absolutely 24 seven, because uh, we, I wasn't born in the hospital and there were no incubators, there was, there was nothing. I was born and I was in my mother's arms and I was taken care of by my mother. Uh, and grandpa, you were born on a on a farm, were you a berry farm, were you not? A hop farm, hop farm, a hop farm, yes. I'm a hopper. <laughs> uh, up in Agassiz, I was born at the, uh, at the Ag Agassiz hop field in an outhouse. Born in an outhouse, and uh, uh, that uh, in the middle of the night, and I think. Uh, you know how long your, your 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 writing tablet is? That's how long yeah. I was. I was that tiny. So my, that's why my mother had to take care of me 24-7 or I would have just died. Uh, I, I, and, and my bones had not set yet. And my skull, if, if I stayed lying in one, one way too long would flatten. And uh, uh, she, she used to just reform my head all the time. And so my very first language is Hunkaminam. My mother would be speaking Hunkaminam to me. Our grandparents didn't really speak English, so there was always Hunkaminam. And our aunties, uh, they were up there in the hop field. Uh, they would be all speaking Hun Kaminam. And uh, then the Second World War happened. And the Japanese were criticized. So all Asians, all Chinese were, were really, really uh, put under scrutiny. And you led a life that the white Canadian, the white American is the hero. Uh, the cowboys and Indians, uh, the hero is a white guy. And you get to the point where you say, uh, I want to be that hero and that hero is a white man. Uh, I wish I wasn't Chinese. I wish I wasn't Indian. And then our dad, who was basically a, 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 a separate 
because of the Indian Act, he, he was uh, an absentee father, basically, even though he was only a few blocks away. Uh, so I didn't grow up uh, immersed in Cantonese. It was always partial, partial, partial. But I, I understood it, but I, I didn't speak it very well. And he got angry at her mother because I couldn't respond to him the way I could respond to her mother in Han Camino. Uh, and, and he would speak Cantonese. And even though I knew what he was saying, I couldn't respond to him in Cantonese. So he got very angry. And that was when I stopped. I said, no, uh, the language of industry, the language of Canada is English. I will speak English and become a Canadian boy. And uh, not knowing I would never be allowed to be a Canadian boy because of my ethnic heritage. And then 40 years later, 50 years later, Howard, uh, you saw him in the, in the video. <clears throat> what are you gonna do, bro? When you retire, 1999, 1998, he was talking to me, 1997. What are you gonna do when you retire, bro? Said, well, you really got a good command of English, but what the hell do you don't know about retire? Retire? I ain't gonna do nothing. <laughs> Because you can't do that. You can't stop working. You'll die. So help. Sign up in the uh, uh, language program and help them. And I'm laughing. So what do I, I'm going to go into this in my 60s. Uh, they said, yeah, uh, you get a UBC student number and you, you carry on at UBC and lifelong learning. So man, so when I finally uh, signed up into the language program and lo and behold, all of the people, all of the elders in that, in that space, they were there as students. That was our largest, uh, a uh, Muscan class, they had, we, we had about 35 Muscan students. And all were, there, or I should say, at least half of them were older than me. And, uh, but they were not first language speakers, the majority of them. Uh, they had learned a lot of phrases, had seen a lot of ceremony with Hulk Aminam being spoken and I'm going uh, and 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 they were saying Hulkaminum is our official language in the big house and I'm, hey wait a minute wait a minute no no Hulkaminum is what well, is spoken in our house and there's a translator if there is that will translate into Hulkaminum or the Hulkaminum speakers. And uh, well, sometimes they were Squamish interpreters. Sometimes they were uh, Lummi interpreters. Uh, but our elders at that time spoke Hulkaminum. But because they were younger senior people, did not hear Hunkaminum in the language, uh, in the big house. And I didn't realize how much my background anchored me in Hunkaminum. Uh, because our, our, your grandmother used to give me a slap and, uh, on the back of the head sometimes because I would come home from places like Steveston with, grand, uh, with our Auntie Sophie, uh, Ray Harris's grandmother, and uh, I would speak, speak to her because it was easier to speak Hulk Amino. 
And she said, no, you can't speak that. They don't come from there. You come from here. You have to speak Hunkaminam. I didn't realize how strong that was. And I, I, I argued, argued, argued with the, the other senior Muslim people that were in there. We would literally stop the class in in our debate, a very, very heated debate. And uh, 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 used to make the instructor cry because of the interruption. And uh, that's when I realized how strong my Hunkaminam roots were. And, and I didn't know that I was a really truly silent speaker at that time. And it's a real challenge, it's still a challenge, but uh, it's my Hunkaminam roots my musqueam roots were truly, truly embedded into my psyche. And it, 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 that's what made me stay in that. I, I thought that I, I would only be in the, the language class, uh, language program for about five years and see you guys later, you know. But the arguments that I had in that first year is we said, no, 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 no. It, uh, you have to hear the history because there's, there's a long convoluted history too to, to, to the uh, dialect change that happened. So it's uh, something that uh, many of our younger people, when I say younger people, the ones that are in their 70s now have no idea uh, of why that change happened here in, in the community big house. So it, uh, and I know our old people would not be speaking another dialect. It, uh, it's like you speaking, well, you do anyways, you speak a different dialect of English. <laughs> but why would you speak French in your house when it's not a French house? Uh, and, uh, I, I try to liken it like Halkaminam is from the uh, west or east coast of Vancouver Island, the like Kmanis area, Halkaminam. Yeah. Halkaminam is our our part of the dialect. I liken it to like France French and Quebec French. There's there's similarities, but there's differences as well, right? So yeah. I just wanted to clarify that for the, the audience there. Yeah, and it's very, very, very much like German and, and uh, Austrian German and, and Swiss German, you know. Uh, yeah. uh, they all speak German, but it's all a dialect. Uh, it, uh, and they're very different at times because what your language does, like Huntaminum and, and Hulkaminum, it ties you to area because certain uh, vegetation doesn't grow on Vancouver Island, and the Vancouver Island vegetation, certain parts of it doesn't grow here on the mainland mm -hmm. unless it's been introduced. Uh, and we don't have words for it, so it, yeah. it's 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 really really uh, uh, very much like we we don't have the words for heaven, hell, God. We don't have a word for Jesus. We uh, the, no no word for devil or angel. It, it's it's all uh, a, a, a part of the uh, French Chinook jargon that we adopt, you know, it, it's very much like, like your, your stepfather who says Masi Cho. Masi is the French word merci. They have no R's. We have no R's in our language. And we do use Masi in a lot of our uh, 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 spiritual ceremonies, but it's uh, it's taken from the French word Merci, Masi, and Cho is big. Mm. So it's a big thank you, Masi Cho. Uh, and he will tell you that if you ask him. 
Okay. I, I'll ask them later tonight for sure. I I know we're, we're running a short on time. I know we want to get to question and answers. I know we have another video clip. I have one last question. It's a two-parter. Um, uh, and uh, I'll ask it and then we'll go to the next video clip uh, because there was a long break. Um, you know, my grandpa, our grandpa, your father passed away when dad was 10 in 1956. You were about 20. Uh, but then you didn't you didn't make the trip over to China until 2013, which was a long time later. Why such a gap to actually return home to see where he's from? I, I, and I, I know that's a big question. But the second part is is when you finally got there, what was the most memorable moment that you had when you were there? I, I remember mine, but I would like to hear yours, too. So um, those are my last two questions and then we'll move on. Two questions. OK. Yeah. Uh uh we were afraid to go to china uh some of the audience needs to be able to see the the film theater in bamboo and there's one lady in there uh, and her last name is joe one of the uh, and she's real oriental but she is part indigenous was taken to China and left there. And she was able to get away from there and come back to Canada. And uh, uh, that that's a good story for, for our audience to kind of research and see cedar and bamboo. And uh, and there are other people here that, that have been taken back to China and left there until they reach puberty and then come back. And we were afraid that that was going to, our mother was afraid that would happen to us and they wouldn't let us go. So we heard that story and we're always afraid to go back to China because we make it stuck. And, uh, it wasn't until our uncle Edmund finally convinced us. I know he was talking to me and Gordy and uh, he said, they're going to tear down the, the, the village, your dad's village or your grandpa's village. If, uh, because they were gonna put a, a, a railroad through there, the, the high speed railroad and, and uh, I said, I guess it's time to go. I'm going. You go, Gordy? Yeah, we'll, I'll go. Uh, then we convinced your dad, uh, Edmund convinced your dad to go. Uh, so that was the reason why we didn't go until then. But it wasn't, and then again, it wasn't until they said they were going to destroy that village that your, your, your dad comes from. And I said, well, I'm going to go see it. And uh, didn't realize how, how, how emotional that was going to be and how that connect, because we were always part of Chinese and we knew we were part of Chinese. We always spoke about it. And uh, we were 100% aware that we were part Chinese. And that was something we couldn't change. So that's our part, that's part of who we are. But when we went in there, and Edmund said, walk into the village. Walk through the archway. Mm -hmm. And then go to your grandpa's house. That moment, it was like, wow. My dad was a boy here. This is where our grandpa comes from. And then walked into our grandfather's area, the house that was there, and was embraced by our, our relatives from China. In that moment, it's like the first girl you hug and kiss, the very, very, very first girl, girlfriend you have, and you, you kiss her, 
that that feeling is huge. It's my connection to China. It's my family standing right here giving me a hug. And that feeling is like the very first girlfriend you hug and kiss. Uh, that really, really embrace. And that's the kind of embrace it felt like with our relatives. And it's a moment you can't replicate. That tiniest little moment that becomes such a huge thing in your life, you can't replicate. Yeah. And, no, I, I remember that day vividly in 2013. I remember it uh, because of the uh, how welcoming we felt. You know, we, it was family. You could tell immediately that it was family. That um, you know the the one thing I remember the, the, my most uh, cherished memory of that comes from that same day is when those relatives pulled me into the house that we we went to went to a cabinet opened up a drawer wanted me to look at photographs and they started showing photographs of yourself dad uncle Gordy but then they started showing photographs of two children and yeah. those two children were my children yeah and yeah. who were three and five at the time so yeah. somebody had been sending back family photos through every generation and I saw my own two children Eli and Isla who are upstairs right now in that photograph and that's something that just floored me that they had photographs of these two children and um you know it's something I'll never forget so that was my most cherished memory I know Sarah we're running short on time so I'll turn it back over to you thanks uncle for always uh, being open with the with the information that you're sharing um, and I'm sure you'll have some answers to some questions online in a moment. But Sarah, I'll turn it over to you for the next uh, video. And I think you have a map you want to show as well. Thank you, Wade. And um, that's actually the perfect segue because uh, the memories you shared, Larry, are exactly the ones we are going to share in this clip. So there's actually two. You'll get to see um, Larry, Wade, and um, Larry's siblings walk through that gate in, in their father's village. and. And I remember it too, it was a very emotional day for everyone. And we're just um, so grateful we were able to capture that for you. And um, we'll play a second clip that shows that, that exchange between you and your relatives and that, that warm embrace. Yeah. Let's see if I have the right one here. Okay, here's the first one. Sorry, this is uh, the one that we just watched. Okay, here we go. It's really something to be here, I think, because you look at it uh, and it gives significance to the, the gate in Chinatown and Vancouver. Yeah. You know, to, to be part of where he actually grew up as a, a boy before coming to Canada. It's exactly how we talk about walking in the footsteps of your ancestors. And, and in Vancouver, we walked everywhere our dad has been. And now we're, we're here where he actually grew, grew up. So, hard to describe. It's something that uh, I think uh, for coming home. All right, and the second clip um, is in the village. The reciprocation that um, we received of uh, that welcoming and that warm embrace of family, that's who our people were, were in Musqueam. 
then, uh, our old people. You know, they were very open arm and uh, welcoming of of newfound friends and what they would call relatives. Took us many years to come here, but you were always on our mind. I saw you come out, and it made me emotional because you look like Uncle Tommy. And for the family here today to show us where our family lived, where my father, our father lived, is so touching. <laughs> To ask the question, did it meet my expectation? It's so similar to how I was raised as a Musqueam person going to visit my relatives on the island that when they saw me, they would say, welcome, you've come home and embrace me. And then when I went to China, the same thing happened. When all was said and done, I was glad that my uncle Edmund convinced me to go and make this trip receive my father's So there we have it. Thank you so much for sharing your, your stories and experiences, um, Larry and Wade. Um, it's such a touching scene every time uh, we watch that. And um, the audience might not be aware that the, the uncle that you see in the film um, unfortunately passed away within the past few years. So it makes that journey all the more important, I think, to your family and, and yeah. to um, to Wade's kids and, and future generations of, of your family. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. So I think at this time, uh, we would like to invite all our, our guests in the audience to um, ask your questions of, of Larry and or Wade and uh, Jasmine and I would be happy to um, help facilitate that conversation. Um, and I can see a lot of you are very grateful and expressing your appreciation um, for this wonderful conversation. Um, perhaps while we give folks time to enter their question in the chat box, I was wondering if you had a question, Jasmine, for, for Larry to kick things off. I mean, I'm just so amazed and blown away, like listening to you talk and relating to it so much. Uh, because I am mixed ancestry as well. I have Hawaiian and uh, Italian roots. And it was it was always such a struggle because surprisingly, I was made fun of it. Um, I grew up on my dad's reserve and I grew up on uh, my mom's reserve, Musqueam. And I was never 
Indian. <laughs> I was something else. And um, yeah, I just could relate to it so much. I mean, I uh, just wanted to say thank you for sharing and it's very touching and thank you Wade for the compliment earlier. It's mind blowing to hear your side of the story and what you've gone through. Again, I've always heard it from other people, but hearing it from you, it's, it's touching. Well, thank you, Jasmine, and thank you for for the words. And uh, you know, I'm I'm always so blown away by our youth and uh, seeing you take uh, a place here in in our traditional homeland and 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 raising up and being role models to to for my daughter. I know she'll she'll see somebody like you and and, and see herself in you. So thank you as well. Um, I do see that we do have a question, Uncle Larry. I'll, do you mind if I ask it, Sarah? I see one. Uh, yeah, Uncle Larry, there, there was a question that says, um, when uh, your, your father and your mother met, obviously they didn't speak the same language. How did they communicate and what did they do to overcome that language barrier? That's from Tina Tam. Tina Tam? Um, I don't know uh, how they uh, at first got through their language differences, but body language is about 85% of communication. So I would say it's, it's very much like that because uh, we grew up with uh, Cantonese speaking farmers around us all the time. So a lot of times uh, it was uh, hand motion and uh, facial expressions uh, and that communicated very clearly what was uh, happening in your mind. <clears throat> so that, uh, that's part of that. And the other part is uh, the language of love, I guess. Uh, that, <laughs> Uh, that's sort of universal when you uh, meet someone uh, you're in a, a relationship and you know what's expected of each other and you just communicate that way so I really don't know uh, when I was a child dad spoke very limited English. His vocabulary was very limited. Our mother didn't speak Cantonese at all. Her, her English was quite good, very good. And uh, so that's probably how they they communicated. I, I, that part, I really don't know. I can see the questions are flooding in, so we'll keep them coming. <laughs> The, uh, second, yeah, there's so many. The uh, second I, one I can touch on very briefly, uh, but it's how will you reach out to the wider community to share this very important story? That's from Anne Marie. I will say that since we screened the film in 2016, um, we're very glad to see communities across North America and even into China um, request to see this film. So it was screened at multiple film festivals, but also um, certainly schools and different institutions have reached out to book a screening or to purchase a, a DVD or a screening license um, during Asian Heritage Month. To this day, we still have a lot of requests. And I know um, Larry, your brother Howard and, and Wade get asked all the time to, to share their story. So it's definitely an ongoing journey. And in terms of uh, the Museum of Vancouver and, and the Chinese Canadian Museum, we're also committed to, to providing that ongoing platform to share not only this story, but, but other stories across the province. And perhaps we'll move to Audrey's question. Um, how did your parents get from Musqueam Reserve? I think the question was cut off actually. It's, uh, it, she it, at the bottom, it, it goes from the hop farm. So how did you get from Musqueam to the hop farm? Your parents. <laughs> my, uh, my dad wasn't there. Uh, 
We got up there probably on the back of a of a truck uh, with the uh, with the farm the hop farm owner. Uh, the the hop farm is probably half of the township of Agassiz. The UBC experimental farm is out there, and that was the. Uh, that's another yeah, experimental yeah. farm. That's the, the, no, part, no. the dairy part no. of it. Oh, uh, the indigenous uh, itinerant farm workers were uh, either their own transport in the back of their own pickup trucks, or, or, or th at that time there were no pickup trucks, they were flat decks. And, uh, and then there was the uh, cattle trucks that they traveled in uh, back and forth from Musqueam to Agassiz. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have another question. Uh, it's for Wade or Larry. Um, did you feel any culture shock when visiting the family in China? Uh, that uh, uh, not really. It, it, the cultural shock, uh, uh, the, the actual shock was the, how many there were. And we had an uncle that was alive that we didn't know about. And that's the old man in the, in the video. Uh, and, and he looked identical to his younger brother that was here for many years. Uh, it just blew us away that uh, Uncle Tommy come out of the grave. But uh, that, was, uh, that was the only shock part. So, uh, but the other, uh, the cultural shock, no, because we were, we were quite well versed in the cuisine that they they uh, they ate and how tiny the village was supposed to be. It, it's larger than I thought it was. Uh, the 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 real shock in that village. They had paved roads in the farm there in that area, and I I, I didn't realize that. that uh, they had paved roads. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's my part. <laughs> I didn't have much either, but I know my father did, Howard, who's in the, in the meeting. I, I'm adventurous with anything. I'm, I'm open to eating anything, really. But my dad is a very picky, and he's actually deathly afraid of snakes. So as he, uh, we made sure that there was actually snake on the menu at one of our, our, um, our meals and he would not come close to the table. Um, so that was one of the culture shocks for him. It was, that was the, the different foods. And I, I did mention earlier that, uh, that I, uh, there was pictures of my kids there and I have a little visitor here that wants to just say hello. Uh, I can't see you if you, this is Isla, my daughter. She's, She's Uncle Larry's great, great niece, so she wanted to say hi. Hi, <laughs> hi Isla. Hi, Isla. Hi. Oh, way to go, Isla. I'm afraid of snakes as well. I think I would have freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, sorry, I'm just trying to find the, another question. Oh, okay, uh, we have another one. It says, uh, oh, sorry, where... Were you less certain about roots? How do we move toward restoration of identity, walking alongside and living? And your story is so special. Uh, the thing about it is, it's not so much the reconciliation for yourself. Uh, it, it, it's being able to stand up and having the general population understand that you're just another human being in this in that sense but uh, I, I know it's uh, I know it's quite a special story in the sense of 
but the story, the, the, the complexity of the story is brought about by Canadian legislation. Okay? The, all of the legislative acts that denied Indigenous identity and Chinese inclusion was all created by Canada, wasn't cre created by us. And, and being a part of that, uh, we always knew and we always, mom always said, you can't change it. You're half Chinese and you're half Muslim. You will never change it because you were born that way. It's how you anchor yourself within at least one side of it so that you can accept the other side. And going to China just brought it all together. We were, we belonged in two houses, not just two villages, but two houses we belonged to. And that's, uh, in our culture, in the indigenous culture, if you go to extended family community, they will say that you come from here. Your blood is here too. So come home if you want. And that, but it, uh, it just kind of filled in all the little gaps of feeling that it was, now it's complete. The feeling is complete just by being in that village of our fathers. Was, uh, that, that to me was now that feeling is complete. Uh, I'm not just a, re a Chinese person by re remote arm's length connection. That is my village, whether I, I want it to be or not. It's all part of me, and I'm a part of that. Yeah. You can't change it. Thanks, Larry. That's really important, I think, as a lot of people are on their journey. Um, Michelle has another question for you. Is Were you able to eventually reconcile with your father despite the separation due to the Indian Act and the language barrier? It's beautiful you honored your father and his heritage by visiting his village. Uh, it was something, <clears throat> the reconciliation, reconcile between myself and my father. It, it was, it's a twofold thing because uh, my father and I, well, at least I was at odds with my father because I never really understood or accepted that a lot of the separation was created by Canada and not by him. And uh, what we haven't said in this is we have a sister, a half sister that was born right after our our oldest brother was born, but she's a Chinese person from, from that village. And we both grew up with the sibling jealousy. Our oh, dad sending all his money to China. And she's saying, oh, dad's looking after his family in Canada. But because of the separation that he had, uh, he was doing what he could, but it, there were many things that he couldn't do. And uh, I was upset at my dad. So I, 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 I held that against him. But after, after going to China and being a part of the uh, growing up in my mind, he's my father. I never lost. I never lost my love for him. Never. That, uh, you can love someone, but if you don't respect them, you don't respect them. But that respect has come back. 
before I went to China. Yeah. Uh, that when you recon ask that question of reconciling, that I, I can't just talk about one part of it. That, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, no, I, 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 I'm proud. I've always been. Uh, it, but it's something that you uh, you become ashamed of for a while. Many of us do that, not just not just our family. Many families grow up like that. Uh, in the in the era that we were growing up in, was very very blatant racism and uh, racial hierarchy that was so blatant that uh, that you uh, that didn't like who you were a lot of times. And that had nothing to do with your parents. It, it's yourself that you you don't like yourself uh, because of the social structure we were living in. You know? And I think many of the stories that come out of Chinatown are very similar. So it, uh, and that's uh, something that we had to learn to walk, work around. And, uh, and not make it a focal point in our lives so that we could actually survive. Uh, uh, so. If I could just add a little bit, because, you know, I've never once, uh, because of Uncle Larry and my father, uh, ever doubted who my grandfather was as a strong uh, Chinese immigrant to, to Canada never knew these stories that uncle has shared with us now i always held my grandfather up as as the man that came here uh overcoming odds and i've always been proud to be uh you know musqueam and 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 a member of the hong family actually i told my father the other day that uh you know i was kind of I, i'm kind of uh disappointed that uh, he changed his name from hong to grant about three months before i was born so i've never had the last name hong and it's something that i I wish I, I had one one day, but I am proud to be that um, because it makes up who I am. It makes up our country. We we are you know we are some of our parts in this can in this country now, and it's because of people like my grandmother Agnes and my grandfather uh, Gordon Hong that uh, that we are who we are today. And I I've 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 um, worn that on my sleeve since I was in elementary school. You know, I, I could sit there and go, I'm not Chinese enough for the Chinese kids. I'm not native enough for the native kids. I'm not white enough for the white kids, but I embraced it. I went and talked with the, with the, um, the Chinese kids because I knew that they're either their parents or their grandparents did the exact same thing that my grandfather did. And I embraced my side as a Muslim person and went to the longhouse because those are the, those are the lessons that were instilled upon me by, by people like my uncle, uncle, uncle Larry. And that's why I dedicate my life to trying to, trying to, um, uh, uh, revitalize this story uh, because I don't think a lot of people that come to this country, especially from from China, know how in, integral they were to building this country, but how integral they were to the first peoples as well. In in the sense that they uh, helped create families that now thrive in this country. My children are are are, are an eighth Chinese, but they identify as Chinese Canadian because they are the descendant of Hong. Tim Hing, and they will always be that, and they're going to pass that on to their children, because uh, you know, I, like I said before, and I'll, I'll end it with my my statement with this: is people ask me, "Would I identify at, identify as?" And I cannot identify as any single thing because I would be doing it a disservice to my grandfather, to my grandmother, and to my grandmother on my mother's side, uh, because they have done so much to to instill who I am today. I can't identify it as one one single thing because I would do doing their their legacy a disservice. I am Chinese. I am Musqueam. I am Caucasian, and I'm proud to be. Well, I need to add also our, our grandfather, your grandfather, my dad, was a paper son. The Chinese audience will know what I'm talking about. He came to Canada as a paper son. You would never have carried the name home because of that. So that uh, he came in under false papers because of the, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act, as many other young men 
of that date is uh, there's probably a, uh, probably a, a publication on paper sons. Uh, uh, I would say a, a large percentage of Chinese men that came to Canada were paper sons and carried a different name other than their family names. That's just why we have that same mixture today in our uncles that are here. They have the, the some, there's a couple of them that still carry the paper names and the other ones have switched back to the, the original family name. So that, uh, uh, that's the other part of why the name was changed. Thanks, Uncle. Uh, it's really interesting. I thanks for sharing that. Um, I have another question, and he there's also a comment. Um, thank you again. I and my family are mixed Chinese with indigenous nations in Malaysia. I was also made fun of because I was cast into the hybrid pot. How did you eventually become comfortable with being in both spaces with both identities swimming together? Thank you. <laughs> it, uh, it's when we finally realize that we're all the same. Uh, the first time was when I come home crying from school at Kona. And uh, mom said, what's the matter? What happened? I said, oh, this guy just singing that Chicky Chicky Chinaman song on me, you know. And they just wouldn't let up. So I started crying and come home. He said, what are you crying for? You are Chinese. I know that's a, a, it's a, not a nice word, but that's what they call you. you know? And uh, you're never going to change it. So quit your crying. She was very, very direct in a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, and don't feel bad because you are part Chinese. And uh, it wasn't until I, well, uh, I got to be an adult and it was, it was quite an interesting way of being. Uh, I had Chinese features uh, that were quite strong. Uh, it sort of softened down, but uh, in my work life, people automatically assume they're Chinese. Then maybe six months, a year later, they would be swearing at me, because you're not all Chinese, you're not Chinese, you're, you're an Indian. The things you say and the things you do and how you carry yourself is you're an Indian. And I never really knew that until it was said to me many times. And then I got, oh yeah, okay, got it. Yeah. It's uh, the teachings of our mother that are, are, are embedded in me. And our, grand, our grandmothers that were alive so uh, it's not until my midlife that I became comfortable, absolutely comfortable. But now I, I know who I am. I am a certified tradesman. I have, at that time, for the period, I have very in high in-depth technical knowledge of my trade. And I met a lot of immigrant tradesmen and when they asked me things that would say, well, you're a tradesman. Why don't you know this? And they said, well, we never learned it. I said, then how can you call yourself a tradesman? And I, I would start talking like that. 
and it's something that uh, I think I'm proud of who I was. Through my trade, I'm Chinese, Aboriginal, that the public that I serviced didn't, couldn't believe that a Chinese person or an indigenous person could be that proficient in the trade. And that, uh, that just kind of made me puff up in the sense that I know more than those guys. Even though I would never be their bosses or anything, I know more than those guys and they have to come to me for information. And uh, I used to get myself in trouble with the foreman because I would harass those guys about how little technical knowledge they had. Uh, and you guys are English speakers. You guys are white guys. You know? And uh, that's something that made me more proud of who I am. Yeah. And uh, that, but then I have to reconcile that with being like somebody lording something over someone, just leave them alone. <laughs> yeah. So I had to, had to re redo my, my thinking uh, on that part. So, yeah. so it's been a challenge, but it's been a good, been a good life. Thank you. I think we have one final question from Melody. Uh, thank you for your generosity in sharing these stories. Was your family in China able to understand some of the complexities of being indigenous or Musqueam in Canada? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Uh, because uh, They have no idea of indigenous groups in Canada. And I know they understand about the, in, uh, the multitude of indigenous groups in China. Uh, but the world doesn't know that indigenous people still live and still exist in Canada, never mind our Chinese relatives, the whole world doesn't know that we exist because Canada does not uh, expound on the, ethnic, the, the native ethnicity of Canada. That uh, this is why a lot of people, when we were doing the Dialogue 2010 project with the city of Vancouver. They were amazed that we were still here. They didn't know that. Uh, new immigrants come and and they they don't get anything in their immigration package about Canada's indigenous peoples. So they absolutely know nothing about us. It, uh, they uh, and not only that. They are not aware of all of the acts of exclusion and assimilation that Canada has developed, not only for the indigenous people, but for Chinese people. So those are the things that uh, the world is, is, is ignorant of and Canada makes sure they are. And, uh, those are the things that our family in China did not understand. And, and because I don't know if they've been researching anything, but they're not aware of that. And the whole world is not aware of it, not just our people, our, our family, I mean, so, so yeah. So. I don't know if I've answered the question or not. 
I think you answered it perfectly. I mean, it's really hard to say what people know about indigenous people, especially in China. I mean, there might be the stereotypical things of indigenous people living in teepees and wearing headdresses. There's so many things that our students are unaware of. So I just like, thank you for pointing that out. But um, I guess we're gonna be wrapping up now just because it's 640 already. I mean, there were so many amazing questions and thank you for answering them all. And thank you for uh, joining us today, Larry and Wade. Um, it was so eye-opening to hear your, your side of the story and uh, seeing everybody comment and ask all these questions. Um, so I just wanna raise my hands up to you and thank you once more. Uh, you wanna say anything, Sarah? I think you've captured it well. I'd just like to echo and, and say thank you as well to both Wade and Larry. Um, you're always generous and, and kind, and I think the world is, is so much better with both of you and your families in it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. And happy belated birthday, Wade. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was Wade's birthday yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> they all <Damn>. Yeah. <laughs> Deeper <laughs> in bed. You're getting a whole bunch of happy birthdays. So. <laughs> yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah. Have a good evening. <laughs> Bye. Wade's uh, kids were waiting for dinner, so he had to yeah. peel off. <laughs> He's going to KFC. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds pretty good. But um, once this is all uploaded, I will be we'll be sending it out tomorrow, um, I believe. Uh, but we'll keep you posted. But I will end it all for everybody. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. See you again. Yeah. Thanks, Monica. Thank you.